So everybody, I'm absolutely thrilled, excited, and I'm freaking out as well. I had no clue what am I supposed to wear this morning to appear um, somehow nice or good for our guest artist, Sharon Davis, who is a remarkable person uh, uh, I used to follow for, for many years, uh, following her achievements and, and uh, seeing how wonderful she's not only putting a costume on actors, but how she is helping actors create unforgettable roles. Because all costumes uh, uh, speak a great story as well. And this is the, the reason why, why we're here, uh, to celebrate uh, uh, Sharon's achievements, but also to, to, to be aware of what we're wearing. Uh, so I decided to wear, um, as usual, something black. Uh, so it was not that much of trauma to, to go through in the morning. A little glitter, just to, to emphasize Hollywood trend. Uh, Sharon, can you see it? Fantastic. All right. And now I think I, I should really shut up and uh, uh, let the, the, the session flow. Uh, we have uh, with us uh, Barbara Bell, uh, and our costume designer. And um, uh, uh, for, for many, many years, I had the pleasure to, to work with, with Barbara on many productions. And uh, Barbara will be our moderator uh, for, for today's session. So, uh, Sharon, Barbara, the floor is yours, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Barbara. I'm the costume shop supervisor here at Williams. It is my pleasure to be the moderator today for our green room event with award-winning costume designer, Sharon Davis. Sharon has had a career as a costume designer for nearly 30 years and has worked on a variety of productions in a multitude of genres. She is a two-time Academy Award and Emmy-nominated costume designer. She received her first Oscar nomination for her costume designs for Ray, starring Jamie Foxx and Regina King, and her second for Dream Girls, starring Jamie Foxx, Beyonce, and Jennifer Hudson. Sharon has also designed prestigious TV dramas, such as Watchmen, for which she won the Emmy Award in 2019. And in 2018, she won the Costume Design Guild Award for Westworld. Sharon has several other Costume Design Guild nominations. As Sharon has said, your art will find you. And she speaks from experience. She started as an acting major and in dance, and it was from a job in a costume shop that led her to move into wardrobe, then assisting, and then designing for stage, film, and television. Working behind the scenes, she said she was captivated, and she fell in love with the marriage of character development and costume design. It is my honor now to introduce Sharon Davis. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming on this Saturday. I know there it's a, I don't know, I know it's probably perfect weather where you are. It's pretty warm in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, well, here we are. <laughs> and um, I am, I, I don't know what to say. I've been on this journey for so long. I, I only know my age through the year, what year I did a film. So um, right now I'm working on a film. We, uh, shut down for COVID and we came back. I just wanted to briefly talk about it. And we're trying to start, we started filming on Thursday and it's been quite challenging, but the arts, I don't know, we just pull through somehow and we're making it work. But um, I feel confident that in the next year, all the art like theater and film will be back and um, theaters will be open and we'll be all engaged again with the dark room with the energy of other people watching a film and a play um 
I started, I guess, my career in the 1980s. <laughs> Um, I went to a school called ACT. I went to a school called PCPA and Pacific Conservatory of Performing Arts where I was an acting major. And then I was registered to go to um, Cal Arts to finish my major, but I never made it. As I ended up getting a job in the costume design department on um, all these walk around costumes and it was history. I just kind of fell in love with the um, with working in costumes as a way of my inner actress coming in, coming out, working with clothes. Um, boy, it's so many years. <laughs> um, I would say I, I was, I've been very, it's been very engaging. I mean, you put 100% into this you know and you have a you end up getting a really big group of family through each film and each project that you kind of move with and hopefully work with again but you do meet a lot of new people on the journey and you learn so much you learn so much not only just about making a film but you learn so much about other cultures i i travel a lot i'm you know barely in los angeles working i go to canada I go to, I, I'm always working in the South. So it's kind of a great opportunity, um, not just for the art form of it all, but just to meet people and learn new cultures and uh, understand how the United States as a whole works. So that's, that's, that's all I'm gonna say about me. <laughs> um, I'm gonna start, I think, with um even though i don't have any illustrations of i wanted to explain how i got my first film because things in the hollywood work very um word of mouth ish kind of so i was on a tv show called 90210 i don't know if you remember that and i was not the designer i used to be what is called a costume supervisor which is a person who runs the finance of the whole department. So you, you actually learn so many aspects in working in costume design. You have to learn how to finance, you have to learn how to negotiate deals. It's a lot going on in um, our, our um, job. Anyway, someone called me and said that they thought they had seen me on set and thought that this director may like my attitude and he'd like to interview me for his film so I mem I got the script I memorized it I memorized all the characters I had all these ideas and then they said yeah you're gonna meet him in a bar a pub <laughs> in Santa Monica and I was like okay how do I do a presentation in that environment? <laughs> but I got, I, you know, this is before computers, so I couldn't send any, any artwork through a computer. So we met, and as I start telling him my ideas about the characters, he goes, no, I just really want to talk to you. I want to see if we can actually, if we're actually on the same page, if we can actually communicate, and if there's a, an awareness or interconnectedness between us because that's what's most important to me. And um, so I was hired <laughs> and that's how I began my career. And I never, I kept that with me the whole time, how important it is to be able to communicate with your director and your, and your actors and, and, and hear them and listen to their opinion and then take all that information and then get creative and put your energy into what you think it is too. So everyone puts in their best, their best energy into their uh, into the product or into the film. Um, after that, it just they just kept calling. <laughs> I mean, I would work maybe one film a year, and then I did, and I kind of fell in love with period films, and. Um, I really do not like contemporary films. 
I don't know if any of you are interested in, I mean, they're great to watch, but I find designing them, you know, it's not the same. It's not as creative. And I, and I love, of course, science fiction because it's highly creative. Um, let me see where should I start because I I will jump all over the place like with with what I do so the first film the first film actually was more sci-fi it was an art house film called Equinox and it was just completely bizarre and it was a uh, during the 90s this famous um, design this famous director named Alan Rudolph who was known for his art house films and his taking it just a slightly to the left of reality concepts. Um, it was a great experience. He had a very, it was in the 90s, he had extremely multicultural uh, crew. And this is the same director who wanted the interconnectedness. Um, he had women, DP, women, you know, he, he was way ahead of his time. It was 92 and everything we try to fight for now, he was already doing it because he was a kind of an evolved person. He, I mean, he was a great writer and he was an innovator, so he kind of already knew how to go. And thus, when you worked on these film sets, you learned so much because we had so many different cultures on our film. Um, so I started there and then my next film was with the German director, uh, Percy Edlong, who, who did a famous film called Baghdad Cafe. I didn't do that one. <laughs> <laughs> did one called Younger and Younger, <laughs> but it was really fun with Donald Sutherland. It was really cool. So I, I must say I was very, I'm very lucky that I, I got to work with these very accomplished, um, very worldly directors for my first jobs. And uh, then my third director was uh, Carl Franklin, who uh, we still work together. Uh, he did Devil in a Blue Dress. So that's, that is what probably put me on the map as a, as a, a design, costume designer. So that would be my first project. And um, I'll show you some pictures from that, I think. Should we start? Sure. The share? Yep. So um, Devil in a Blue Dress. Um, wow. I think that was 1995 <laughs> with a young Denzel and a Jennifer and um, wow that takes me back and Denzel and I have known each other I'm gonna say since the 80s before he was actually a famous actor I, I knew him at a school called ACT in San Francisco. So we have a long history together. Um, though he doesn't actually hire me, I'm hired by the directors. It's, it's easy, it's really fun to collaborate with Denzel. He does a lot of homework. He, he really brings a lot to the table as an actor. So it's always, and so does, um, oh my God, I'm looking at him and I'm not remembering his name. Don Cheadle was also amazing to work with. Um, Denzel and I have done over seven projects together and I'm about to start another one with him. He's gonna be directing um, a film in New York next year and I'll be with him there. Um, the, this show, all the clothes are, we wanted everything to be like very minimalistic and very clean. And even though it's 19, end of 1940s, 50s, we really wanted it to still project a timelessness and not, and also a feeling that they were definitely a working class African American um, community. Um, the movie, we have wonderful big shots of extras and street scenes and parts of Los Angeles that are still look actually the same. So we had a great, it was a great, this was a great time to do a film back in the 90s. It was a little, there was a little more freedom um, 
to move than there is now. <laughs> um, so this was my first big costume design film. I, I was a little over my head, but I did have a lot of support. And I met, I learned a lot on this. Each film you learn so much. So the knowledge you have from one film, you, I just store it away until I figure out what's going to happen on the next because each director and each production designer and a production designer is the person who designs the whole film um, in the art in the art it's gonna ha it will have a different concept so you need to always stay open to see what their ideas are and then you can start incorporating your own so we're gonna jump to <laughs> 2012 where I had the great opportunity to work with the savant, uh, Quentin Tarantino, who definitely views things in a more mm, graphic, comic world view of filmmaking. And everything is in his head. Every detail, every chair, every, he's, he is amazing. He knows the music for every scene. When he writes a scene, he, he's amazing. So he is very visual. So there is a illustration book of at least 50 illustrations for each character. He had to see every character illustrated. He didn't want, and it couldn't be on a modern day illustration platform. He did not, he wanted it hand sketched because he felt like the hand sketch is a two-dimensional art. And then when he would see the person in the clothes, it would be, it would be a more exciting three-dimensional kind of breathing piece of art. So we had a great uh, relationship on this show. I mean, this, the subject matter was a little hard to swallow sometimes. <laughs> and there's always lots of blood in his films but I love his creative process and it was a great honor to work with him. So Jamie's blue outfit was so risque. <laughs> um, I, I felt like since this is so comic booky, why don't we just take it to a place and do the blue boy painting? <laughs> and cause we can, this is a show where it's not real. It's not a reality. So you're not really in 1850 because the story did not exist. So we touch lightly on the silhouettes of 1850 and then we get to expand our creativity. So this would be one of my favorite shows to do because I really creatively got to do, got to take it to where I wanted to. Um, all the women well, um, were extremely fun and I played with a lot of different periods for the clothes. And it was a very bright um, palette. And then we did Dream Girls, and the director of Dream Girls is Bill Condon, who's an amazing, amazing director in film and in stage, and a great writer. He wrote Chicago, but he wrote he wrote Dream Girls for for film, and then he directed it. And this was a great relationship. Also, um, I had a wonderful time working with the cast. Jennifer was very new and the, you know, it was very overwhelming for her. I mean, just as the, the whole process was, but she, once she started singing, <laughs> it was, everyone would just, mouths would drop. It was, she was amazing. She was amazing. I mean, it was new for Beyonce, Eddie and a new, sort of role he's never really done. So the energy here was tremendous. It was incredibly fun, incredibly fun. And it was, a um, we all had a really good relationship. Everyone, some films are, are, there's a lot of disconnect, but this one was very connected. And so it was a great transformation. And one of the things that Bill really insisted on was that all three girls dress exactly alike, even though they do not have the same body. So that was a big challenge for me. 
because and Beyonce has of course a different body than Jennifer and so I'd always have to come up with a design that would work for both their bodies so that was challenging but I like that he did that at the end I, I understood why he did that Then this is Get On Up with Chadwick Boseman. Um, he's a wonderful, he was a wonderful person. He gave gives 200%, he's incredibly kind, so talented. He worked day and night learning how to dance like James Brown. He, um, it was such a, we were in Mississippi I don't know why, <laughs> but they did, the director's from Mississippi, so we shot in Mississippi where there are no supplies and no clothes and no one to sew. So the challenges are always different, <laughs> but uh, we made it through. And uh, I, I must say I was very happy with the end project. And, uh, and I will always honor Chadwick. He was an amazing actor. Then here's Denzel again, Fences. And the challenge here is it's a it's an award-winning play. And we're going to format it into a film. So costumes, I'm, what are we going to do? You know, what am I going to do? Am I going to make it, am I going to take it into a film format or I'm going to keep it into a play? How do I stylize it so it still has a feeling of a play? So, um, basically I've just kind of punched colors a little bit more and, um, we kind of, we, it was, we, we really played it like a play. I mean, we even shot it like a play. So we used, it was very earth tone, lots of earth tones with just a few bits of color as it's a very intense drama. So color plays a very important role in filmmaking when you're trying to, if it's a comedy, it's gonna be a lot of bright colors and, and big prints. And if it's a drama or an intense story like this, you're gonna see a more downplay in color and in texture. Then <laughs> I really had done a few science fiction projects and I wanted to expand the, uh, my resume. And this was my first opportunity to do that with the film Godzilla, which really didn't have that much science fiction-y clothes, but I did have to make a lot of jumpsuits and hazmat suits that did not really exist. So from this job, I end up getting Looper, and I end up getting uh, Westworld, and then Watchmen, so I, I can't complain. <laughs> and then this is another one of my beginning shows. This is of after, of course, way after um, Devil in a Blue Dress. This would have been my second big uh, costume design film. And uh, Jamie Foxx and I have worked together three or four times. Uh, but this was my first time working with Jamie. And this is what's called, a, this is not a studio film. This is actually, this was actually done on a very small budget. This is an art house film. And we had no money. And Jamie had 120 changes. And it was very, it was, it, it, it just, was quite a challenge, but we made it through and the music pretty much carried us, the music of Ray Charles. Everyone would get like elated when the music started. So it kind of carried us through our jobs or, you know, working on a film, it's it's so much of a, you be, everyone becomes like a family. And then there are so many things that keep us going as we're working 12 to 14 hours a day on a regular basis. So you, the people you work with really become important to you and they kind of keep you going and keep you creative. And this is The Help, which was also shot in Mississippi, and that's the same director of Get On Up. 
which I must say in this film was a great idea to shoot in Mississippi because of the subject matter. I did this in honor of my grandmother who was a maid, a domestic in Louisiana and she was actually still alive and she, the state of Louisiana took her to see the film and treated her. It was, it was an amazing time for her. Um, but this was great fun to, to just costume design. I mean, the subject matter, there's two story points here. There's these young, in the early 60s, these girls were barely 20 and they were already wives and having babies and just weren't. And then they're also caught up in the fact that women were now becoming more liberated and starting to work. And there's one woman who's, there's one young girl doing that and she's shunned in this group of girls. And then there is the, the, the maids, the black maids who are now, that's becoming a thing of the past too. So we're caught into a time, a change for all women. I think this, this point is a pivoting point of that. So that's the statement I feel that the help makes. And then here's Watchmen, which when I did this in 2018, and I absolutely fell in love with the subject matter. Um, it was amazing to get a script and have to add water and make it turn into a forest. <laughs> I mean, there was no description of these masks. There was no description of her costume. So every element of this series, I. I got to design from just simple concepts. So I really enjoyed this show. And that was supposed to be a science fiction and look where we now. Oh yeah, here we go, yeah. The mask and the storyline and really we were we were thinking, well, no one's gonna watch this. <laughs> and then here come the, um, and then here it, it is matching, you know, the history of, our country at, at the same time. So, and then this was Westworld, which is when I took the second season, I thought it was going to stay Western, but no, we had Samurai World, we had uh, Raj World, we, had a, we went to a lot of different places besides Western World. So this was a definitely a really great creative endeavor. So that's just a little run <laughs> of my life. But each of these shows, like like Westworld takes a year to make. And so it really, and most films, it, I can do two films a year about. I try not to do that because I'm just exhausted. <laughs> but um, that's, that's uh, I don't even know what to say. It's such a, um, such a different reality from when I was younger and I was out in the world, you get so caught in the film industry, you, you really need to take time out to realize the reality of the world. But then again, it does reflect the world. You're so close to it already. I, I take three months off and I go, oh, I'm not really, I am still here. Oh, I see. <laughs> We're still hitting the same topic. So just doing it in a different way. So it's kind of a great, it's a great career. I, you know, I've been very, very, very happy I, I went down this road. It takes a lot of, uh, I don't have any children. <laughs> I mean, I, that was, that I don't think I could have had this career with if I had children. But um, it's okay, you know, and I'm still doing it and I'm over 60 and, there's no kind of, there was no age discrimination really in in film and TV. And metaphorically speaking, Sharon, I think that you have gazillion children around the world who are <laughs> pressing, who are just copying and paste, uh, pasting uh, uh, ideas from from your movies and and try to <laughs> look just like characters from from your movies. I hope so. I'm hoping I'm encouraging a, a lot of young people. I, I do do a lot of um, 
young um, speeches and and I do a lot of group teachings for for younger people mm-hmm. like most of you so um, to encourage you know you to find your your art and your or where you want to go and you know keep keep you happy and keep you keep you active and and challenge knowing that a challenge is a good thing you know a challenge is a good thing it's it's not a it sounds like such a hard word but you know it's such a good thing and then it never ends either and that's the other thing don't think oh i'm finally done but no the next one's going to come around the corner and they just keep coming and that just keeps us all the, the vitality and the energy going so um let's see what else can we talk about <laughs> now it's the time for our moderator i suppose barbara the floor is yours <laughs> thank you thank you sharon thank you so much i think everyone is probably a little bit in awe and speechless of your amazing career um i know that i can speak for myself i'm so pleased to have finally gotten the chance to you know meet you and show some of your incredible work um and as you said may it continue for many many years to come I would like to start the question and answer session, if that's all right, Omar. Super. And I think I'll take the first question, Sharon, if you don't mind. And it's sort of relating to the Williams students that you will see here on a majority of this Zoom meeting. And as a small liberal arts college, many of our students are taking their first theater class. They have little or absolutely no exposure to any design experience prior to taking this class, an acting class or a directing class. Could you talk a little bit about how a costume acts as a starting point from which visual storytelling can convey a character's identity? Well, we'll take, um, I'll make it easy. <laughs> Regina King, of course, for Watchmen, she had no idea. She's never done anything like that. So she was, and I've known her. She said, oh my gosh, how am I gonna, I, I, I can't, I don't know how I'm gonna do a superhero <laughs> or hero costume. So I said, well, let me just send you the illustration. And then she went, oh my God, I know what I need to do now. I mean, that, just sometimes the drawing but when they put the costume on even the the simple as the fences when viola put her dress on and her apron she kind of knew she got a sense of who she was at that moment and you see it over and over when you can help the actor work with you know become more aware of who he's going to play or she's going to play or going to be and and wardrobe i feel is the first place that happens you know hair and makeup comes along and of course that their natural amazing talent uh the actor themselves and the direction but i feel the um costumes is the first trigger to help them figure out where this character is going and who they and who how are they going to portray this person Samantha. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm actually Barbara's assistant. Um, and in our shop, Barbara's very much uh, the designer and I'm very much a maker. Like that's how our balance works really well. Um, and I, I, do, I do love making for a, like a period piece. But then I can also like super appreciate when a designer can you know, push that and create something like just like outside of the period and create something a little different. Um, I'm so interested in how you then like how you approach then like the more like science fiction part of that um, as a designer. The what? I'm sorry. The the more the science fiction part of being a, uh... like like a science fiction design um and how you go towards that you know like i feel like it's uh we have all these things in books that tell us a lot about period and a lot about um like how things have evolved through time but then you know like science fiction is outside of all of that it it is indeed and really i i do 
a lot of research on other visuals uh, or other shows or, and just trying to not do what they're doing, you know, and really, <laughs> it, it was, it's interesting. I mean, I, on Watchmen, I, I just, when I just had an idea of how she should look, I was really weird. I just thought, oh man, you, Sister Knight, she's a sister, you know, she's a sister, she's a and I just, it came to me really fast. But then I wanted to make sure we'd never seen anything like it. So you do have to do a lot of research when you do science fiction, because there are a lot of science fiction shows and you don't really want, you can come close to something, but you don't want to do exactly the same. But it, it, I mean, that was, it took me 50 drawings to get there, you know, 50 Absolutely. quick ideas. And then I find, okay, I think I've got it. And then researching it and, and there was just one, but it was called Sister Night. It's from the original sh kind of comic book anyway. There's a comic book that Sister Night, but um, that's about it. It's really, they really, it comes from my head. And then I have to make sure I didn't see it somewhere. Right, I actually, sorry, I'll follow up on that. I feel like you had talked earlier about like modern clothes and how, you know, like modern clothes is harder in a sense, you know, like we all have, like everybody kind of has their idea of um, what their character will be like in a modern sense. Um, and so like, I feel like sci-fi is like so, so much further from that um, where you can, where you really can play with that. But it's like equally as hard because then people have that idea of like their idea of sci-fi. Right. It really yeah. opens your, I mean, it, your, your imagination will just open. So, it, and then you, it, it becomes a very personal thing. And then you just kind of research it to make sure you're not close to something else because in film and TV, you know, we have copyright infringement. So we have to mm -hmm. make sure that we are not doing something that someone else did. Thank you but so much. It is, and then I and I again, once again, on on when you're doing contemporary or present day, it's that is a challenge with an actor because he gets sometimes they get caught up in how they like to look as opposed to how mm -hmm. they're supposed to. Look. Indeed. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. They don't go to themselves, but when it's the same, when it's in the present, it's a very hard concept to grasp sometimes. I've always said, Sharon, that often a contemporary piece is somewhat more difficult than a period piece because your contemporary actor knows and has an opinion of how they think they should be looking, but they might not know anything about 1740. <laughs> right? exactly. So it can be, um, it can have a whole different um, challenge for it in, in its own way. Exactly, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, other questions? Is that you again, Samantha? No. Will, wait. <laughs> Will? Will. I was saying thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Will. Hi. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Sharon. My pleasure. Um, so I had a question. Um, I, I was curious about how, you know, more abstractly, how you've seen the role of a costume designer change over the past few decades that you've been working as a costume designer and how you think it may change over the next few decades. Wow, it, it definitely has changed. Um, it is because of all of our technical devices, it's so much faster. They expect everything so much faster, but the illustrations on computer or on the board are so much slower <laughs> than doing a quick hand sketch or doing it. But um, so um, you end up having to hire, we always have to hire concept artists now for film because I, I can't be at a board for three days, you know, covering up. So you, I still do my quick sketch. I still send it to a director and then we do a broader color illustration later. Also, the um, just the, when people now send emails, or when you're when the producers or people above you that are not as they're not as creative, they feel that once they've sent that email, 
you should probably have that answer. <laughs> they're not, you know, they're not thinking that, you know, our job is creative. It's not there and it's, we're making something. It's not like, okay, I know you sent the email. That doesn't mean I'm ready. Or they'll hire an actor and send you their contract and go, okay, they're going to come in tomorrow morning. And you're like, I don't even know their sizes, but you know, <laughs> so things because of, of our computers and our phones, people feel that once they hit send it's their their job is done and and i should be ready for that so that's that's a big challenge and um we don't have as much time as we used to we i mean we used to have a lot of time because you couldn't communicate that fast which was great <laughs> You know, we would do our call sheet is our, we would have at the end of the day, they do a sheet which tells you what, where you're going to be the next day and who's going to be there. Well, we would only work eight to 10 hours a day because they had to get the sheet out and there was no email. So they had to almost hand deliver them to people. It's like someone sometime would drive around LA and slip them under your door. It was crazy. I, I can't even believe that happened. So <laughs> it was just like so archaic. Um, so the computer's just made everything. It's made people think that we can be faster. We're not, but they think we are. And I've just had to, um, I really have to take a lot of technical courses when I'm not working so I can keep up with how everything operates. Because everything, like, everything is a program now. Raven, I, did you have a question? I think you had raised your hand. Yeah, I do have a question. Hi, Sharon. Thank you so much for coming today. So I kind of have a question going back to the um, period um, design, um, because like uh, I encountered some some like uh, shows about a really a set historical period and it's based on like true story and real people. And like when I'm approaching them, like I kind of trap in a feeling of like replicating what I research, um, what I find maybe in catalog or do historical research, like how do you express your creativity in this kind of project? Yeah, that's right. my question. I hear you. Um, in Dream Girls, you know, even though I, I, cut, I changed all the necklines, I made them all modern because if you don't change, you know, if you're sh for film, especially even for a play, I feel people really only re they're in the present day. So some things just look odd to them if you do everything head to toe and period. So you take your little creative eye and you think, you know what, I'm going to lower that collar. I'm going to make that waistline maybe a little lower just just for my for fun for me to create something but also the audience i will will be more comfortable with it because they understand that one they don't they don't you know all these jewel neck collars and all that choked up and the way the the you know things sit in the 60s is not as sexy as it is now so i had to lower things because when the when I'd send it in to the director, he'd go, wow, that's, that's not even attractive. So <laughs> I just said, okay, I'm just gonna, so I just start switching everything. So you have, you know, you're, you're already telling, a, you're, we're not doing an autobiography. We're doing a bio, we're, we're doing a story about a certain thing. So we do have the right to be creative and change things and make things sometimes more romantic or, you know, and use your own, use your own mind to do it. I mean, just use your own creativity because that's going to make the story more beautiful than just being factually autobiographical. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you so much. Anthony. Hi there. Uh, Hi. I'm a, I've been an admirer of your work ever since Devil in a Blue Dress. I loved it so much. So it's such an honor to be here. Um, but I did want to ask you, I, I am also a costume designer. Um, I primarily work in theater, um, but I do some film and I do enjoy it. It's a very different experience. Um, but I wanted to ask you about how we were talking about how the role of costume designer has changed over time and is ever evolving. 
um, if you could speak a bit to within theater, I know within the past few years, the design union there has been fighting for pay parity between scenic designers and costume designers. And there has been a feeling for a very long time that some of that uh, disparity between the pay is because the role of scenic designer has always traditionally been male heavy and costume design has been very female heavy. And so if you could just talk a bit to the role of costume designer and how you see that evolving hopefully in a good way um, for equality and uh, you know the raising of equal voices and contribution. Oh, you know, that's so interesting because that's our biggest, that's our biggest thing right now too, trying to get equal, equal status to the production designer because we don't have it either. Um, we also, I don't know, do you have agents for, for stage? Some, some do. Some, it's, some. some it's rarer. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean. But even still, I have an agent cutting my deals. But I'm like, why am, why am I getting five times the rate of our base rate? That's ridiculous. I mean, and everyone, you know, I, I'm going to say 60% of people are doing that. So obviously that rate is wrong. Mm -hmm. And it should be matched to the production designer's rate. So we are, we just did a huge survey and everyone, we no names and ask for everyone's rate and everything they get and we're going we are doing it we're taking it to uh the union and we are trying to up our rate because it, it is you know it doesn't work for the times it doesn't work for what's needed it's not enough money the base rate is 2800 a week or something for for tv and that's really not enough money to live in a big city like la or new york so most people don't get that, but why should it be that low? So it's been a, it's a brutal fight, but we're trying to match it with production designer because that is definitely a male heavy. <laughs> yes. Oh. Guys, yeah. Thank you. Omar, you generally ask a question and you haven't yet. I can ask the question. Yes, you may. I, oh my, oh my God. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I have a question because I was just, I, I didn't want to spoil it and I didn't want to hop in. My question is very difficult. Um, <laughs> answer will be easy, but but question is very difficult. What is your favorite color, Shannon? Oh my gosh. You don't have to be biased, of course. <laughs> Oh, there's my favorite color on, you know, I don't actually have a favorite color. I mean, my favorite color personally is probably black <laughs> because- you made my future. <laughs> but I oh. like to use color on all my projects. So that's when I love color. I love color on on different individuals look mm -hmm. good and different. Like I love Barbara's uh, sweater color. I love that color. It's, beautiful and rich and vibrant but I really you know black I don't know I just isn't it, isn't it Sharon like when when we wear a certain color and I'm committed to black and I my my, my all pieces are in black for for decades um that I found myself be very very curious and very um uh, absorbent when I see other colors uh, when I'm preparing myself for for a speech for 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 scene in, in front of the camera or, or or stage, when I have different color than black, that has a greater meaning for me than if I would use any other colors every day. <laughs> when I have like like piece in blue, I I'm asking blue why blue, what it means why why this color oh oh maybe this one uh, why red. So in, in in a sense, I'm I trapped myself into black box uh, <laughs> choice, but it didn't. It, I didn't feel like a prisoner of of, of this um, choice, but but rather uh, someone who allowed him to be very alerted when I see different colors. Um, uh, 
Um, oh, yeah, I totally understand. Yeah. And, and also, it's just when we are on set, it's easier if you wear black, you're not. They like you to wear black. It's like <laughs> a stage hand. They like you to wear black. It's just, you know, white is such a nightmare because they can see you everywhere and it draws attention. So it was like, oh, black. OK, I can do that. <laughs> so um, and then I just felt more comfortable in it. I feel more comfortable when I'm giving. I feel like I'm neutral if I wear black when I'm doing fittings with actors and actresses. I just feel mm -hmm. I don't I'm not relaying anything. And in the morning, like I, I'm, I'm looking in, in the box with so many socks and I don't wonder which would just like like I need the whichever sock it will be it will be great. <laughs> so I save a lot of time by by committing to to, to one color. Yeah, you yeah. don't. Yeah. Uh, Sharon, you're meeting uh, Denzel tomorrow. I've been I've been told. Yes, I have a a meeting with Denzel Washington. He's um, directing. He's going to direct a show um, in New York coming this year. It's. Um, called Jordan, Jordan's Journal. I'm not saying anything secret because it was actually a best-selling book. And it is, I think, 1990s, but basically contemporary. But it's an amazing book if you ever have time to pick up something new. It was a great book. It's quite a tearjerker, but it's a great story. And um, he's very excited about it because wow, he doesn't have to act. He's not acting, and he's only directing. Oh, by the way, we have plenty of actors. <laughs> I have I have a lot of young generation actors in my class. So if you need any, I, I can know. offer that. It's all on the East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brittany is um, on a uh, chat and she would like to ask a question. You ready, Brittany? Oh, did she put a chat in? She put a chat to me if she could ask via chat because she well, wrote and said she would love to hear about the reception of work by her fam by your family and community. She's worked on a number of iconic films, especially iconic black films. I would love to hear more about share what how Sharon thinks about the role of costume and dress in black communities. Well, for a while. <laughs> People didn't know I was actually black. I, did, I don't know why. I guess because I was doing it so long. And but I, I think the awareness came. I don't even know. Maybe Akilah and the Bee. Or uh, I mean, I'm thinking, wow, you didn't you see me on Bray already? But um, I mean, my family is very proud. I mean, my dad was always skeptical of me doing this. He wanted me to be a doctor. Um, <laughs> but I was like, Oh, yeah, dad, I can't do that job. Um, <laughs> but he's very happy. And um, I'm very proud to actually do all these films that are um, related to, you know, myself you know and, and my family like i was saying the help i know is very controversial but it was important to me because my grandmother was the help and even though it's not shown in this amazing light she still i felt she felt she someone cared about her that she was actually you know attention was being paid to what she did and i find that that's just very important you know that that happened um well, I've, Watchmen was probably the biggest eye-opening of all the ones I've done um, because of the 1920s um, Oklahoma massacre, um, which was harder to shoot than anything I've ever had to shoot. We were actually recreating a horrible piece of um, hidden American history. Um, I mean, Devil in a Blue Dress was a slice of life in um, Los Angeles where African Americans or blacks could not cross over to um, Hollywood or Pasadena or Glendale. They had to stay in the south side of Los Angeles, be, you know, 
after nightfall. We could not actually go over. And the sign did not get removed from Glendale, California till 1960. So, I mean, we learn all this too while we're filming. We learn all the, the, the reality of and the history of, of some of the things that happened. Even Ray had a lot of history. I mean, he got to go to a deaf school. He was the first black young man to ever attend this, uh, this, site, this um, school for the blind in the 1930s because he was so talented. So I, um, I love that the films I do do open, open some real history that really happened for, for blacks in America. I think um, we are at closing time. We're getting towards the end. Um, if there's any final things, Sharon, that you'd like to share or not. Uh, and if not, I can't thank you enough for doing this with all of us. It has been a thrill. And I can't wait to see your future endeavors. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, Omar, if they have other questions in the future, they can email to you. Is that correct how you have, yes. in case they think of something after our session is over? Okay, and I also, I'm yeah. on IG. I have a Instagram. Super. You have something to ask. Sharon, I hate this moment. What am I supposed to do with myself after the session? <laughs> oh my God. I will miss you and, and thank you very much for, for, for sharing pieces of, of wisdom and, and for, for inspiring us for so many years and, and especially today I feel uh, so optimistic about uh, where we're heading. Uh, there's a cinematography, there are stages and we'll, we'll get there uh, because we are resilient. And uh, we have phenomenal uh, uh, folks of great achievements to, to, to look at and, and, and know that there is a great example to, uh, to follow, even uh, during this or especially during these uh, uh, trying times. So thank you for inspiring us. Uh, say hello to Denzel. <laughs> and tell him we have plenty of students, actors uh, who are keen to, to perform. Fingers crossed for, for all your uh, uh, successes. And, and I hope to, to, to see you soon somehow. Thank you. And I wish all of you the best and for all your, all everything comes to you the way you want it and success and hard work <laughs> comes with success. But good luck in your futures. You're Thank you, Sharon. It's been an honor and a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. You're amazing yourself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.